Today on the Flight Brothers, we're doing a full power-up, flight, and landing in the Ilyushin 76 in what I believe is the first and only tutorial in English on x -Plane. We're going to start today's tutorial with a quick tour of the cockpit. The Ilyushin 76 is set up for a crew of seven. The captain, the first officer, a couple of flight engineers, as well as a navigator located down below. We have a pretty typical panel and pedestal setup, but a lot of the rest is spaced out. For example, this overhead extends way back into the flight engineers, and that's where your starters are hidden. The flight engineer stations I'm going to refer to as flight engineer rear, which is on the back wall, and flight engineer left, which is this one that we're looking at right now. I'll just call the navigator the navigator, and that's down in the nose cone section. It has a glazed panel, but there are a few things down there we can use. Up here, about half of it is uh, dummy photographic textures, but that panel you're looking at now works as well as the flight engineer left panel we saw a moment ago. All the critical systems are pretty much going to function, uh, so I don't think it'll bother you too much that there are a number of dummy switches located throughout. All right, so in the nose cone is uh, one of the coolest features. Uh, I highly recommend, when possible, jump down here during taxi and uh, low altitude climb and descent. Just a gorgeous view. We have an Avatab located here. A little awkward to get to when you're flying, but you can jump down with a hotkey. Uh, the entire real panel is not functional, but is an accurate photograph of the actual panels. Located right in front of this Avatab is one more navigational device called a KLN. When you download this aircraft, you can have it with or without the KLN. I'm doing this tutorial without, and I recommend you do it without. Uh, if you want the KLN, you need to download it separately. The KLN version will not function without that installed. And everything above there is also dummy versions. This is a freeware aircraft available on the xplane.org store. It's currently in version 1.1, although I had a 1.0 also. It is also possible to get the Beriev A50, which is essentially the AWACS Airborne Warning Command radar version, but it's exactly the same inside, so you can still use this tutorial to fly it, and man, that's a mean looking bird, isn't it? Now, why is there not already a tutorial? Why do I think ours is the first? Because everything is in Russian, and we had a breakthrough yesterday when we found a Russian manual for a different non x version. Uh, here it is, it was extensive, it labeled everything, so going page by page, I put it through Google Translate. And that was enough. Uh, I was actually able to get this aircraft flying without the manuals, but it's certainly nice to not be guessing anymore. Let's talk about liveries. There's a number of liveries available for this aircraft, and I actually went and got them uh, from the same Russian site from a much older version. I didn't even bother downloading the whole aircraft. I just got the uh, liveries out of it, threw it in, and they all work with the newer 1.1 version. All right, so let's get things started. You can use Shift F3 to open and close this cargo door. It would have been closed, but I opened it for the video before we started. You can see there's an interior pressure bulkhead and then the exterior doors. Beautifully rendered. Again, free aircraft. Amazing, isn't it? Shift F1 for your left main door and Shift F2 for the right. And the right includes that ladder, which just really a uh, nice little touch, isn't it? There we go. Incredible aircraft. Let's get started with our power up. Uh, since we have a flight crew of seven, you're going to be moving around a lot because all these jobs are delegated. I suggest using control and then the number pad to select hot keys if you haven't already done that. Make one back here for flight engineer rear. And we're going to start off with batteries. We've got four of them here and you can guard them after you have turned them on. This aircraft's electrical system is um, 
little different from what I'm used to. I think it's because there seems to be a number of different voltages flowing through the aircraft, and so there, there might be some different inverter situations here. The manual said this is a ground power bus, so we're going to turn that on even though we haven't really officially connected any ground power, but we're going to do what it says. Now I believe these are some sort of inverter or power converter, so click these two on. It's going to power up uh, most things up front. All right, so this is supposed to be the APU current converter. I don't know if that also means it's some sort of inverter to go from uh, DC to AC. But regardless, we are going to turn that on. And you'll notice that brought everything alive up front. The GPS is on, the indicator lights. The, your map is hidden in that little uh, tube there. It's a neat thing. So at Flight Engineer Left, we're going to start the APU. The main switch is in black there, so click on the main. The fuel pump is the top left, I believe, so we're going to do the top left. The one on my manual had one less switch, that's why I'm guessing a little on the top. APU mode on. And then the air damper flap, I, I would assume this is its ventilation, should be open. So I'll click that open. All right, the start button is the one on top. The stop button is underneath. If you wanted to abort, you would push the bottom button. Or when we're ready to shut it down, we will come back for the bottom button. But for now, press and uh, hold the top one. I think I clicked it twice to get it going when I was recording this. As is often the case, the voiceover is being done post-production. There we go. You can see the uh, various indicators going. I'm not sure if I'm going to release the full translated manual because uh, I want to respect the person who made it. There we go. One of those is APU's heating. I don't know if that's an APU fuel heat or just heating the APU itself. Uh, the top left, you see the green lights. Um, the the right-hand board up there is a failure board. so. Since that switch turned on something in the green board on the left, I'm going to leave it. All right, now let's turn on from the rear engineer station, the APU, put it on bus. Then the ground can go off bus. So the center left is APU, center right is ground. Current converters, really not entirely clear from the manual I had what needs to happen with these so I'm pretty much just gonna leave them all on I haven't had any issues I'm just a little thrown that some of them have yellow lights and some have green all right back up to the captain's position Now, before we start engines, we should really turn on the uh, navigational lights and the beacon lights. Uh, your exterior lights are on this right-hand panel. The far right is your nav light. Coming in from the right, the third one in from the right is the beacon. You'll notice it, it's a slightly different looking switch too. It's uh, those two little white ones. It's the one on the left. It doesn't hurt to go outside and verify all of this. So I was mentioning, um, if we can find a way to contact the Russian creator, uh, we haven't really tweaked their manual, we're not taking credit for it, but we don't want to reshare it without their permission. Although you can go to the link that will be provided and translate it yourself, just copy and paste in it, Google Translate, and you'll get exactly what we got. Alright, so the center flight engineer station, I believe, is going to be the person in charge of starting the uh, panels overhead. Here's our start order. Uh, two, three, one, four. So inner and then outers. Turn on the igniter with the big toggle switch and press the starter. Uh, I wrote caution there. It's really just an indicator light that it is starting. When the light goes out, the engine has completed starting and you may use another starter. I think the point for that being there we go. Until the light's out, you might not have enough uh, bleed air to run another engine. Although, I'll be honest with you, in sim, you can start all four at once. It's not, uh, it's not simulated that picky. Now, the fuel flow cutoffs down below, we did not actually turn them on. I think when you click start here, they kick in automatically. I assume in real life that's not how it works. 
So here comes engine one. Later I'm going to show you what all these engine indicators mean, but basically the top is sort of an engine speed. You can see it's in percent and we have two needles, which is interesting. So I don't know if those are different uh, compressor levels, sort of like N1 and N2. Going to Google Translate, the manual comes out as uh, many things on the internet would be if you translate them. It's a little bit rough, but it was enough for us to figure out or verify some of our procedural guesses for this startup. When I did this recording, I figured you'd want to see this service cover open, so I just threw it in here, even though that's a silly time to have it open. It's the only engine service cover that opens, and it is this switch, so it's uh, kind of hanging out by itself there. The first time I flew this, I just threw all the switches, and that opened up, drove me nuts. All right, so engine speed, exhaust gas temperature, fuel oil pressure. You'll have to go back and pause to read the rest. All right, we're gonna turn on the generators now. They were to the left and right of those bus ties. And then I believe these are bus ties at the top for those generators. Once they're online, take the APU offline. We're gonna connect the 27 volt system. And I believe this is the whole like, wait a minute, what are we doing? Why is this extra step? Um, that's not something I've really seen in a different airliner, but I do believe those need to be on. All right, now the APU is off bus. We can use the stop button to shut it down. We're not gonna turn everything on the APU off though, because you'll get some warning lights. So uh, we're only gonna do the air damper. So I'm gonna kind of wait till it looks like it's just about shut down and then close that. Oh, air dampener mode. Okay, I'm just playing with the rest there. You can see they bring on warning lights, so we're gonna leave it. So air dampener and mode, the two lower ones. Now this one, I didn't have anything in my manual on because uh, their sim was different. I'm not gonna put all of my little arrows for you. I just went and turned everything on. From what I read in their manual, it sounds like the fuel system on the real bird has seven tanks and one might be used as a ballast uh, with the pumps and cross feeds. It was not clear enough to me which one might be the ballast tank, but this sure looks like a fuel flow diagram to me. And that also helps to explain some of the extremely far forward tanks if you were gonna use them to uh, balance the ship. So for now, just turn them all on, I guess. Uh, you can kind of mess with that yourself. Should you actually have some knowledge of this aircraft and wanna clear the record, feel free to leave comments. Uh, we, we know this is uh, educated guesswork here today. So before we taxi out, let's turn on the exterior lights. We have fuselage lights, uh, actually right on the fuselage on the nose, and then wing lights. These two switches are a little unusual to get to go. Sometimes you've got to be at the right angle. Pretty cool looking, isn't it? All right, and here's our wing lights, which we'll turn on there. I think you'd taxi with the fuselage and you'd take off with the wing lights. There. It just came on. Not super obvious in the daylight. I'm just going to turn them all on now because it makes my life easier. All right, we're at Moscow, Domodedovo. Uh, there's your ICAO code, UUDD, Uniform, Uniform, Delta, Delta. Our ATIS, I'm just pulling from the default map in case you're not using Navigraph. So now we get into the autopilot function. Click on the center of the yoke in version 1.1. In version 1.0, somewhere different. It's actually just mounted, you don't have to click it. And you've got some very old school X-Plane things here. But the good thing is they're really easy to use. So click Dialing on over to um, COM1, dial in your ATIS, right. and pull it up. Advise on initial contact you have Quebec. Now the uh, altimeter is in metric and I haven't bothered to look up the conversion yet because it's just a pain. So I'm just gonna push it for standard. We're not flying an IFR today, so the fact that I don't know the exact uh, field Dumbly height from the altimeter is not going to be a huge factor. Okay, over here, on the first officer's side, is the Garmin 430. It's not super difficult to use. It's just like a simpler 530 or a very simple version of the 1000. 
Uh, you can put in full routes, you can put in procedures. The only thing I noticed it doesn't quite do that you could do with an FMC is I couldn't find a way to put in airways. So pretty much you can put in your your specific waypoints, but you can't put in like we're in the uh, Romeo 101 airway that, that I couldn't find. But maybe it doesn't and I just haven't found it. So uh, you can select some different procedures for arrivals, departures. I'm not going to bore you, I'm, I'm going to clip it out here, but I'm going to put in a flight plan down to uh, Sochi where the Olympics was a few years ago. My goal for this little test flight is to get us up to cruising altitude, just make sure everything goes right, make sure the autopilot tracks the nav, make sure that the uh, aircraft doesn't depressurize and give us all hypoxia at 10 or, 10 or 15,000 feet. And the vertical navigation, I've actually never really used on the Garmin before. So I'm mostly going to handle my climb on my own as well as the descent. We're pretty much just going to use the rule of three. Okay, so we have some interior lights. Uh, just note where these are. Over on the left, those four black switches are not dummies. Those are going to be panel lights. You're going to want to crank those up so that you can see if you get into the darkness. I really should have thrown it into night mode for a minute just so you could see the difference that those make. All right, so there's our taxi out route. We're pretty close. The winds are calm, so we can kind of use what we want. Live traffic's on, but not showing anyone in our vicinity right now. Handles pretty nicely on the ground. Uh, it's got that big, excessively wide gear because the uh, Oh, I should talk about flaps. Second notch is 30. Weird thing, the flap handle moves forwards to deploy and backwards to retract. <laughs> That'll throw you off if you were actually manipulating this with your hands. You can see that fantastic view from the nose cone. Honestly, it actually kind of helps you in taxi because you can see the uh, you can see the center lines really well. But you've got that enormous oversized gear uh, because these are built for rough undeveloped airfields I haven't found it to be too difficult to taxi actually I will say though you need a lot of thrust just to get moving but once you're rolling it, it picks up pretty quick so keep an eye on that okay I threw the trim at you there real quick the manual I had said uh, trim down 4.5 to 5.5 and I briefly showed you an indicator it's the center of that indicator, that's your stabilizer and your trim settings. So we're going to get ready to roll here. We need to turn on the strobe lights, which are right beside the beacon. It, the, the three far right lights are the ones you're going to want there. So you're going to turn on the center of that to get the strobe. You already have on the far right the nav and the first of those three, which is the uh, beacon. Okay, also transponders down here. So I'm going to turn that on. If you're going to do some VAT sim or something, they're going to want a transponder from you. So here it is. On runway okay. three, two, Life is metric, left. guys. On Sorry. runway three, two, <laughs> I don't left. do a lot of metric. So here you go. On the airspeed indicator, about 260 uh, is a ballpark rotation speed. You're going to bring the nose up to about 10. I'll pause the video and read those other indications I gave you. Sorry, it didn't make sense to show them earlier, but that scene is just not that long. We're not going to be using a fancy calculation for some sort of uh, takeoff performance. We're just going to basically floor this beast. The manual I had here from a, again, it was from a different sim, said uh, you go to 110% power for up to five minutes. And that seemed like a good way to ruin your engines to me, but that's what this sim manual told us to do. All right, so these are relatively low bypass engines, which uh, you'll notice versus a high bypass. I feel like they're very much dogs for the first couple seconds, but then once they start going, you can overspeed relatively quickly. Uh, I'll be honest, at that rotate speed, I just gave it the slightest touch back and she just flew off the ground. We're hitting about 300 so we're going to do our retracts of gear. I believe the number I put up earlier was about 320 for a 
climb speed and they suggested adjusting up or down one degree from your 10 degree standard for you to uh, increase or decrease airspeed should you not be getting what you need. And we can do our flap retract. I think they had a suggested uh, altitude for that of 120 meters, which is about 400 feet. And a flap retract at 200 meters. No, I'm sorry, that was flap retract. At 200 meters, they're going to suggest that we go to AP mode. 200 meters is about 650 feet. So let's get ready with the autopilot here. So here's our autopilot over here. The modes are very simplistic. One of the tests I'm going to run today is we're going to climb in VS and see if it will capture my programmed uh, cruising altitude of flight level 320. Now the actual autopilot panel on this aircraft is in the pedestal. And by the way, you can see it is successfully commanding the aircraft. So in the pedestal, just in front of the fuel Altimeter cutoffs, setting. behind the throttle, is a colored, very colorful board. Oh, by the way, yes, you can punch the button on that altimeter to go to standard. That will avoid you trying to figure out the metric for 2992. Important to note, see the uh, CDI button there on the left? Notice it says GPS. If you want the autopilot to follow this, you want it to be in GPS. It does have other modes, you, but that's basically your source button for the autopilot, is that CDI button. Using a flight plan, you can do range there, switch through. When you see this nav screen, you can push that far right knob set, push it, don't turn it, and it will scroll through these displays. One of the weird things with the Garmin is when you switch different modes, think of it almost like it's covering the one that you were last on. So sometimes you have to push that mode again to make it go away. It's Just don't be surprised the first time you play with it if you have trouble finding your way back to the map. All right, so the autopilot, um, if you're really curious and you really want to click the actual colored Russian autopilot uh, switches on the pedestal, go ahead and comment, and maybe I'll throw it in the comments bar, um, which color and symbol equals which one. But I'm assuming that you're going to spend your time using the nice English panel on the left, so why not? All right, uh, up there on the left, just outside the uh, square of those four indicators, just above your left-hand yoke, is your mock indicator. And maybe I should go back and throw a tag in here. But the mock indicator is really, at this altitude, going to be the most useful. So you notice the lights came on. You basically have auto throttle, a uh, heading hold, a pitch and a roll command. That's really what those top lights are. I'm trying to remember what the bottom ones are. The knobs and scrollers on the bottom of that uh, panel are actually for trim. So here's our beautiful nose view. I'll be honest, I would, I would pay money to go for a ride <laughs> in the navigator's bay of one of these. Just what a view. Incredible. Uh, you'll notice fuel tanks. There's only three on this using the X-Plane uh, default menu. And that's part of why I wasn't too worried about what we put into that fuel board because it's not that accurate. Just cheating with the map to see our altitude. Forgot to turn off those landing lights, we'll do it now. Now, I did discover, shortly after cheating with the map, this display wasn't on. On the top left, turn up the brightness, and here we go. Oh, look at that. The top right button toggles between meters and feet. Hooray, we're not in metric anymore. Your chances of VAT simming successfully just went up. Uh, nothing wrong with metric. Certainly, most of the world is using it, but for us, uh, us crazy Americans, since we only really use it in science sort of things, uh, it's just we're not too used to ballparking it. My brother actually lives in Australia now. He does metric for everything, loves it, but he's using it every day. Uh, it still drives me crazy when he tells you temperature in Celsius. 
All right, we're nearing our cruise altitude. I'm just going to see if it captures. And I'll cut to the chase and tell you it does not. So I'm just going to go over to altitude mode. And it is going to successfully hold the altitude. One of the things I'm not quite clear on is the airspeed indication doesn't switch over to Mach. So on that autopilot, I was just running it at, uh, I think it said 292 up there a second ago. And that seemed to be holding us at an appropriate mock setting on the uh, needle, so I wasn't too worried. So now that we've seen that we didn't get hypoxia, let's turn back. I'm going to throw in here a, a boatload of time lapse. To descend, rule of three is basically for every thousand feet you want to descend, you're going to come down about three miles. And I'll simplify this further. You tend to cruise at about 30,000 feet, and ground tends to be around zero roughly. So normally that's going to give you about 90 miles to descend at that uh, rate. Uh, I think a moment ago we saw we we're only about 50 out. So between the turn and slowing down I might try and descend a little bit quicker than that rate. Here's our ILS plate. You can see the glide slope is going to be a DME of 8 which will be interesting because things are in metric here. Just for quick ballpark I'm going to double it in my mind, so I'm going to be looking for a DME of about 16 kilometers to give me an approximate uh, glide slope intercept. We can set the course here, or using the heading bug on that autopilot panel over on the left. The uh, panel on the left is going to be a lot easier to manipulate. So there you can see we're approaching the, uh, it's a three degree, so all the speeds are going to be pretty typical, you know, about 750 on the uh, descent rate. You notice our two DMEs for DME 1 there. So we're still pretty far out. Going to speed things up again for you. I have thrown the ILS. Um, it is tuned up. I was just going to try this ADF to see if anything changed. Didn't really change any of the indicators. And the ILS is programmed in right now to the Garmin. So it's just about set. You'll notice we have a localizer and a glide slope and they're on that uh, little artificial horizon. They're very tiny, very tiny. So uh, as we're getting close here, the autopilot's turning us out. I don't know if it's turning us out to swing back in, but I wasn't trusting it and I wanted to wrap up. So I'm going to take over manually. You just reach over there and click off I believe uh, the big white one to shut it down I think I'm going to do them all individually but I really want to fly this approach manually anyway because I'm curious to just see how it handles today I've only ever flown this uh, a few times before and I was mostly playing around so I really didn't worry too much about making a beautiful landing I'm going to try and skip the time lapsing for you so it might take us a moment to get down here because I just want to talk about how it handles. Our flap settings are, uh, I believe we've got four of them here. The first is 15, the second is 30, that's what we took off with. The third flap setting is 43 degrees and then the last one I didn't find a, a number indication on it but I believe it's something like 50. It's really quite enormous. You'll see it when it's out there. And uh, I will go for the full flap setting here. I actually found to stabilize this was not a big deal. It really was floaty in a good way, but forgiving. Uh, my, my closest comparison was, uh, in my mind, to the 707, which also had four low bypass engines, an enormous old school wing, and really enormous flaps. And with the 707, I found if you got below your target speed, you were going to just start falling out of the sky. So you really had to manage the throttles because that low bypass takes forever to spool back up. But with this, um, I am adjusting throttles a bit, but it just seemed really stable. It just seemed so inherently stable. I wasn't too worried on the way in. Each flap setting 
definitely made a difference, but it didn't seem to grab the aircraft, so it didn't get ahead of me here. Looks like we have the slightest bit of uh, crosswind there. Now we're going to get a little bit of X-Raws as well as some of the included Russian sound pack uh, talking to us in a bit because I'm going to get a little bit off the glide slope. You can see our vertical descent rate is just about where we want to be. And I know that yoke looks like it's moving all over the place, but it really felt very gentle on my end. It's actually really nice to land. Really enjoyed this. All right, our DME is counting down. Probably about a little over two miles now. Approaching. Three, two, left. The manual did have a chart for uh, flap performance based on weight and speed. I might try and add that here to the video, but I'm not sure how relevant it is because um, I'm not seeing that much sign that this aircraft was built to really fly to the numbers of the actual one. So it might not actually be that relevant to you. I think if you just start flying it down and feel it out and get it stable, you're going to put it down at an appropriate speed. Okay, we already have our full flaps. We're going to be a little bit long, but it was just so smooth and we're so slow. I had absolutely no doubt we would still come to a stop safely in time. Long landing, long landing, last nine oh, actually, thousand no. hey, we're feet within the marks of the legal. All right, touchdown rate was about 400 looked like to me. They have an included sound that uh, makes it seem rather rather violent. Sounds more like a controlled crash. You can see the clamshell reversers there. They uh, deployed and retract. They actually look really good. And you get a warning light on those little boards above. I had actually forgotten to turn on the uh, lights, so we'll put on some lights for taxi. Shame on me. See, look at those. Those are enormous flaps. I believe that's... That might be a flaps 50. Uh, the, it's just huge. It is actually kind of enjoyable to land with that much flap setting because um, you have the ability to float so much. It's just a very different feeling from, per, for example, the Boeing airliners or the Zebo. And as, as I mentioned before, the beautiful nose cone view for taxi in. Just a, a mix of brake and rudder there for ground steering. If you want to shut down these engines, grab them, and you actually kind of tug the wrong way to get them to move. It's a little bizarre. And just to make it look like we're here, oh, well, I guess I left the beacon on. Let's open things up. And with that, we're going to end the first English tutorial for this aircraft in X-Plane 11. Thanks for joining us on the flight, brothers. And as we always say, plan the flight and fly the plan. Yeah.